Hello, and welcome to the Patron Saints of Pop Culture podcast. As always, I am your co-saint, Miguel Covarrubias. And I am Kathy Covarrubias. And tonight, we're going to talk about The Handmaid's Tale, Season 2. Uh, we are going to be talking about the whole season, and we are going to be doing a two-part episode here because, uh, uh, obviously, there is a lot to talk about. Yep. Um, uh, if you have not yet uh, seen the season, um, I would encourage you uh, not to binge watch it. Um, no, it's okay. Take it one episode a day. Yeah. Um, unless you're one of those who likes to binge watch uh, things regularly. That's, you know, it's completely up to you. But, uh, um, you know, we're just warning you because we're trying to be nice. Yes. Um, I would say if you're going to try to binge watch it and, you're you know, make it easy on yourself, it's okay. Take a step back. You know, go watch a comedy, maybe an episode of like Perks and Rec, and then come back and watch some more of The Handmaid's Tale. That might be a good way to watch it. Yeah. Um, so we are going to be talking about uh, the whole season. So there are some uh, trigger moments in the season. Uh, and uh, we probably will not get to some of the, the bigger ones, but uh, just beware that we are going to be talking about those things in this um, again, this is part one of two parts, and uh, we'll let you know when we're uh, in part two. Yep. Um, so, uh, our review and summary, um, whereas this is going to be completely uh, different from, uh, I almost called it Iron Fist Season 2, <laughs> uh, but uh, Luke Cage Season 2, where um, I wasn't able to give a good uh, summary. A uh, good summary because uh, not enough happened. I felt yeah. like nothing happened. Here it was like everything happened. Almost every single episode, there was something that just that happened that was kind of that like, was like really important. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 obviously we're going to leave out a, a lot of important stuff. Um, so we're going to uh, say this is. This season is uh, really the uh, culmination of the pregnancy of of June's pregnancy of uh, her really uh, um, losing hope and regaining hope and uh, moving forward with who she is, both as June and Alfred. All right. Okay. Um, my summary. Um, uh, we start off. And um, we realize that June's plan to escape escape number one <laughs> fails. And so she's really, um, really saddened by that. Um, I guess that's near the beginning of season one. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a lot of repercussions, not just for her, but for the other handmaids as a result of what happened. And so she kind of has to deal with that as well, too. Um, and then the pregnancy kind of like continues on and she still is trying to find ways. Um, she has some doubts, but she does end up, you know, still thinking that she wants to, you know, protect her baby and get her baby somehow out of Gilead. Um, she ends up having the baby. Um, and I need to wrap this up. I guess I'll just stop there. Okay. (laughs) I don't know. You wanted me to wrap it up and my mind went blank. Um, so... I think this was a a fantastic second season. Um, this was much better than the first season, in my opinion. Um, of course, this is brand new territory because they kind of covered the entirety of the book in season one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is this is kind of building on the same themes that were in season one, but bringing in a lot of uh, I think anxiety that we feel today, and so. I think it's going to be. I think for me, it's definitely a blessing. My my mm-hmm. review is is a uh, you know it was a fantastic season too. Yeah, um, I kind of almost feel sad for those folks who are watching the season later on, because when for some odd reason, I don't I don't know how this happened, but by some like miracle, I don't know how else to put it, but something would happen in our nation. And then, like, the next episode would almost directly tie in with whatever was happening in the news that week. It was was a mirror effect, and it was was, weird. It was, but it was so on point, it was bizarre. Which, which brings up, uh, I did reach out to my, to my friend who is a writer on the show. Mm -hmm. Um, My question to her was this, 
how did it feel as a writer when these episodes <laughs> were coming out at the same time as almost the exact same thing happening in our country? Mm-hmm. She didn't respond to me, so... Oh, you built that up like you were going to get this whole big reveal about what she was going to say. And, no, and then... I, I really wish that she had, re- like, I'll probably add it in later if we if she does respond to me. But, uh, I mean, it, it, was, it was uncanny. Like, that I, when the uh, big news broke of um, the U.S. separating families, I mean, that, you know, those scenes where... where um, June is being separated from Hannah and, and all of these. Well, and Emily being separated from her family, too. Yeah, exactly. And on the border. Mm-hmm. On the border. Yeah, <laughs> uh, when she's uh, trying to get to Canada. And, like, it's just, it was so much. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it really struck me when they were, the border patrol, I guess, was, um, you know, questioning her about her, like, her being a parent. Yeah. They were like, "How? no, there's no way for you to be a parent. Like, two women can't be parents to the same child. Mm-hmm. And you have to prove, like, you have to prove who's the parent. And that's exactly what, we, like, what's happening right now is they are needing to prove they are somehow the guardian or the parent. And one of the only ways that they're able to do that is through, like, DNA testing. But sometimes... People are adopted. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are living with, you know, further, like more distant relatives, still family, but not like directly tied in with parents. So it's really hard to do that and still consider to be like proof that they're like the head parent, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And that's what really was getting at what was getting at me was that these parents that are that are being separated from their families down our southern borders are going through the almost the exact same questioning Mm -hmm. that emily was going through well and this brings me to my point but uh um i want to ask if your review is over first before we move on oh yeah no i um i don't think that i mean i think the season is still going to be as poignant to people who watch it later but for us that watched it like as, history as, was happening. as it was happening, like it was really just like mind blowingly, I don't know, yeah, uncanny. <laughs> well, this is, I think, especially for our show, when we we talk about bringing pieces from other worlds back into our own world, mm-hmm. when it's when it's so parallel that it's, it you know, we're a step away, yeah, like a literal step away, and this is this is really what my point is going to be is that last last season last year almost an exact year ago we talked about um how there were parallels with with season one with what was going on and not direct parallels but you know very adjacent parallels exactly whereas this one it's almost there Mm -hmm. like i mean you can you can turn on the news and it's almost like an episode of the handmaid's tale yeah and I mean, this is something that uh, to those who have not grown up in evangelical culture and those who have not grown up um, in the, uh, uh, well, what is being called the uh, the Christo-fascist movement, um, you know that uh, you don't really realize how deeply ingrained this is in evangelical and fundamentalist Christian culture that that this that this Gilead is is basically what is already being lived by a lot of these groups mm-hmm. that um the the a lot of the southern churches a lot of the evangelicals and the fundamentalist churches in the south are and mainly the white ones I, because i know that uh, there are completely different views of theology with uh, different cultures um i mean there's some Excellent books on this, and uh, you know we can uh, you can message Honest Faith later. We'll we'll get those uh, to you somehow. Yeah. But uh, the the Christo fascist movement, and, and I can really sum this up by pointing at one evangelical leader, is Franklin Graham, and uh, I am I'm going to call him out because really it's he is the one that really espouses a lot of what this movement is about. Um, I mean, looking at his uh, Facebook and his Twitter feeds, uh, this is this is he is that movement. 
Um, this, uh, I think, really came to a head recently when he called progressives not godly or ungodly. That's what he said. Yeah. It was that progressives were ungodly. And uh, this is this is not just rhetoric. This is this is basically reaffirming that split in the evangelical church is is equating liberal or progressive with not Christian. Yeah. And uh, you can see this in Gilead, especially with the commanders, and you see it more, even more so in season two with that that split. Is that anybody who thought anything differently than the the I, Gilead is a prime example of the evangelical Christo fascist movement? Um, this is, I mean, if anybody thought anything differently than them, they were sent to the colonies, they were killed right away, and you saw those books in season two. Um, uh, as, uh, Miranda is, I forgot her name suddenly. I blinked. Who? The friend that, uh, is with Luke now in Canada. She was in mm, the, uh, mm, in... Mm. Yes, I know who you're talking about. I can't remember her name though. But, but the uh, friend that, the friend that is with her husband in Canada. Yeah, that she, she was looking for her wife and found her wife in the pictures, um, uh, as she was going through those. And, you know, you saw that they were these big binders full oh, of yeah. of dead, of people who were found dead and people who had take, taken pictures up to Canada to, to show them. And um, honestly, this is this is the way that I, I can see if if this evangelical movement, this evangelical Christo fascist movement does get their way. That's what's going to happen. Is that those who think differently, they're going to be killed or shoved out of the country somehow. Mm-hmm. And and this is something that uh, much like Get Out, much like uh, Stepford Wives, much like uh, Rosemary's Baby, um, kind of shows uh, that uh, this this weird control of reproductive rights happens, that, that it, it really instills in these movements – and you see this playing out on the national stage right now, and I'm going to sound like a, a tinfoil hat conspiracy wearing, or tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist, or the other way around. You know, whatever you want to do. I could wear a conspiracy <laughs> theorist. You know, whatever. Um, but uh, you see this playing out on the national stage with with uh, the Supreme Court nominee uh, in in Kavanaugh, with. Uh, this playing out with them saying, "Oh, he's going to overturn Roe v. Wade and all of this other stuff," and they're they're celebrating this, and they're celebrating this, and and we see this playing out, mm-hmm. and this is this is what Gilead is after the after the fact, and I mean, it well, almost, with a few other extra well, laws yeah. added to it. Well, of course, but it's it's <laughs> it's, it's it's the the steps to becoming, and uh, I mean. I can tell you if you have if you have grown up in an evangelical or a fundamentalist church, you know this. You know this to be true. You've lived that life. You've lived in a Gilead esque place because that's what your church was. Mm-hmm. Um, I say this, and and people are going to say that I'm exaggerating about my church growing up, but I, no, I'm not. Um, they the women were not seen as as people there. They were seen as objects to be controlled, especially with the reproductive rights, with uh, with um, making sure that they had kids and that that sex was only for procreation and not for, well, intimacy in in and of itself. Um, and I really, I'm sorry, I can go on forever on this topic, primarily because this is this is what I grew up in, and now on the outside looking back at it, is I didn't see how how much of cultish behavior it actually was. Yeah. And and I mean there are a lot of people who would who would have told me that I was being brainwashed and, and all this other stuff and that that growing up in a in a church like that that um you know and they you know there's whole people people who would have told me these horrible things that about my church that they're brainwashing you and blah blah blah. And I would never really would have seen it. Until I got to this point where I'm on the outside now, is that outside looking back is that no, they twisted the gospel. They really twisted the gospel. And and this whole thing, um, and I mean, I loved that, that end, uh, the end, 
episode where um, Serena goes before the tribunal or whatever they're called and uh, requests for their daughters to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this just, this is just mind blowing because for me, um, I mean, they saw in Eden's, uh, Eden's copy of the Bible that uh, she had it underlined and she was actually reading it, which is, it was against the law. But I, this is something that I think that will be not just uh, against the law for for women, but for all evangelicals, mm-hmm. for all of them. That the only people who are allowed to read it are the pastor or the uh, the deacon or whatever, and and this is this is part of that control because then you can control the message that they hear from the Bible. And this is the thing is that once I got out of that. Once I got to reading the Bible for myself, once I started to read what the words actually were, I realized how liberal, how progressive Jesus actually was, Mm -hmm. that he just loved everybody, that the gospel was that, was that God loves everybody, no strings attached, no purchase necessary, that it's, that it's pure and simple love for who you were created to be on the inside and it has nothing to do with your gender or who you love or anything else like that that nothing else matters that it was just you i have a question yeah so i wonder if um because you had mentioned um you know the other movies as well too kind of as like tie-ins i wonder if maybe some people who are like within those types of groups that you were in growing up um how those the people who are in positions of i guess more privilege like say all of the men and the types of groups that you were in maybe they were unwilling to see the injustices that were put in place in the group because they were put on that pedestal oh of course and so they were afraid like they're maybe a little bit afraid to kind of um second guess that um your their theology because if they do that means that everybody else like goes on the same playing field as them, and so that kind of threatens their position. Oh yeah, and that's that's the thing is that controlling controlling the book means that you get to control the message. Yeah. And Jesus's message was about tearing down power structures, tearing down power systems, and saying, no, 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 no. everyone is on the same playing field. Yeah. There is no hierarchy. That's kind of why when people say that they, oh yeah, I've, I've read all of the book. Or like I've read the whole entire Bible. I go to Bible study every Sunday. And I'm just like, no, you've read the passages that were in the Bible study at that time. You've not, you have not read the whole Bible. <laughs> well, see, and that's, that's the thing. And, the, you know, we talked about this with the Rob Bell documentary uh-huh. was that um, people don't know, understand how to read the Bible. They don't read it as a, as a full narrative. They don't read like... Luke as a full narrative, they read chapter two of Luke at Christmas time and they completely forget about it for the rest of the time. <laughs> and see, the thing is, it was meant to be just one solid read all the way through. Yeah. Like this is all part of the same story. We're, we're telling one story here. And this is a story about a guy that's saying that God loves everybody. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. Yep. And then he was killed for it. Yeah. And see, this is the thing is that we have... We have now, which uh, with our very extreme evangelical fundamentalist, almost savior in the White House now. Ugh, don't say savior. Well, that's what it is to them. I know, but not to me. <laughs> oh, I know. But Hashtag not my savior. <laughs> is that all of a sudden he is forgiven for everything that he has done wrong because this and we'll one. To do wrong. Yeah, exactly. For this one topic, for the control of reproductive rights. Mm-hmm. And that's that's their only issue is because once they control that, they control the rest of the country in according to their their messed up brains. Yeah. And like this is this is cultish behavior. This is why I'm I keep saying that it's like a cult because it is is. And the thing is, I know that not many people are are equating uh, evangelicals as or fundamentalists as really the driving force behind a lot of this. But. They, when it's been what they've been living for, for the past, I don't know, 50, uh, 60, 70 years or so, that, you know, the ideal time for them was the 1950s. But uh, 
that that this is this is their time that they're really finding that this is the way that they're going to shine they've been afraid of becoming irrelevant and now all of a sudden they're relevant um there are many of us who uh are part of groups who are really kind of pushing back against this and this is primarily if you follow me on twitter you know that this is primarily where i i end up uh losing a lot of followers on is because I'm standing up against this. I'm saying, no, 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 this is not the message of Christianity. This is not the gospel. Um, you can, uh, you can find them by uh, searching the hashtag, uh, empty the pews. Um, uh, Christopher Stroop has a wonderful article about, uh, Franklin Graham and about his, uh, evangelical movement, especially with, uh, what he's been doing with he's calling Decision America. Uh, he's going to the Pacific North, Northwest starting in August. And it's basically to get out the theocratic uh, Christo-fascist vote, basically to uh, register people to vote for Republicans who are really less than ideal, uh, even by Republican standards. Yeah. And uh, this is, uh, I mean... Empty the Pews, you can find, uh, there are plenty of podcasts now, uh, progressive Christian podcasts that are that are really uh, fighting against this. And I, I really, I do like to uh, have a little delusion of grandeur that I am part of this resistance against <laughs> uh, the uh, twisting and warping of Christianity, um, primarily because I do still slightly consider myself Christian, uh, but... Uh, um, Completely different views. And so I, I do like to think that I'm part of the resistance. Yeah. Talking about the resistance, man, I'm so good at segues. <laughs> like, I should write I, a book. I laid it out segues. for you. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at our notes today, my topic literally just says the resistance. So if you guys were wondering, <laughs> it's literally spelt out here. All right, so I'm going to kind of talk about the parallels between the resistance that is happening here in America in real life versus... 2017, 2018. Yeah, versus um, the Gilead America, I guess. Well, they're still kind of America-ish. because. Well, we America. also found out that uh, America still exists in Hawaii. Yes. In season two. So. Yes, Hawaii, and there's like a few other places like out west that are still America. Yep. Um, but anyway... So, um, when it comes to resistance um, factions, I guess, um, especially the the groups that are fighting for more um, progressive ideals, like you know United Health or like a universal health care and equal rights for everybody, and you know um, all of that jazz, I guess. <laughs> like those are the ple- like the main blanket types. Um, Whenever I like to imagine the resistance as being similar to um, Hydra. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, the evil Hydra um, that Captain America is fighting. I'm talking about the mythical creature Hydra. Um, With that creature, when you chop off one of their heads, or one head, I guess it starts with one head. When you chop off the one head to grow back. And it just kind of keeps going on and on until, well, you've, if you've seen the, um, I guess, the cartoon Disney movie of Hercules, yeah, it's like that. Like, it gets out of control, and that's like the whole thing about the Hydra. Um, and the resistance movement in Gilead is doing exactly that. Um, just when the government of Gilead thought that they had squashed the resistance, when they thought that they got rid of the complete network... Little did they know, by doing that, they actually ended up recruiting a bunch of new people to the resistance. Well, it's, it seems to be very much like um, uh, set up like uh, cells. Yeah. Um, like, like, um, like they're independent from each other, where Mayday may have been just one cell. Yes. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to the resistance factions, and you can see this everywhere. I mean, it's just not happening in America. I mean, you can look back. Um, I mean, you can look in China um, when they had, um, I can't remember how long ago it was. But, well, pretty much any country that has had yeah. like a, a progressive movement uprising, um, it's pretty much the same pattern. Like the, the um, 
the people gather together, um, try to form a faction to form a resistance against the tyrannical government. The government tries to push them down, but the harder the government pushes down, the harder the people push back. And the more the government pushes down, the more people end up joining the movement to push back. And so it becomes harder and harder for the government to squash the resistance in the end. Yeah. So um, with that in mind, I have a feeling eventually Gilead is going to go away. Well, we kind of know that because in the book, like they're yeah. talking about Gilead at the very end as in like past tense. So we know it goes away eventually. And when we see the resistance really pick up movement is when the handmaids are punished and the way that they're punished i don't know i don't know how anybody could have walked away okay after watching that scene but the way that they were pretty much tortured the whole entire day then at the end set up to make them feel as though that they were all gonna die just oof, i don't know it just really did not feel very good I thought that was the opening scene, was uh, them on the uh, gallows. Was and then, it? then uh, punishment was after that. Well, that's, I mean, that's still, wouldn't you consider that to be a punishment still? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, you don't just, you know, send people to the gallows for doing like, hey, good job at the farm today. Let's go pretend we're going to kill you. <laughs> yeah. But after that happened, like, I, I feel like um, it kind of got the whispers started amongst mm-hmm. everybody else um and i feel like um nick has more connections with other drivers but we just haven't seen like the driver resistance yet we know that they're there because nick is there but we don't know you know the whole connection between that but anyway um and as i said before the more people that end up joining the cause so the more times that the government ends up pu- like punishing the resistance. The more people end up joining the cause because they can see how tyrannical the government is. Um, the more people end up seeing really how bad the government is in the end. <laughs> so really, the more that the government pushes back on this resistance that's happening in Gilead, all it is going to do is just end up dissolving Gilead eventually. Um, heck, we saw um, that um, Rita... When she at the very at the very end goes and um, tries to get June to finally go to Canada, like she set something up. She even says, "No, um, me and other Marthas got together and we did this for you." Yeah, other Marthas. Um, I think maybe something that kind of sparked the Marthas going into the resistance was that scene where there was a Martha that was murdered. Yeah, like out in the street by the overzealous. Um replacement uh, commander. Yeah. Um, I think that kind of, the Marthas kind of realized, oh, we're not, because, and comparatively to the other times of higher, like the hierarchy of women, Marthas aren't that bad, I guess. I mean, yes, you are essentially like a glorified, like maid and housekeeper, but at least you're not being raped once a month. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? So, like, in terms of, like, how bad it could be, they're they're kind of, like, in the middle. And, you know, as long as they blend in, they're fine. But the fact that they were had a target put on them after that, they realized, oh, wait, we're in danger, too. So maybe we need to step up and join this movement going on as well. Heck, even the wives. I mean, June was able to convince Serena to try to make some improvement in the lives of the wives simply by what you're saying just by reading the bible like they can't read like we realize like how far the extent it moves to i mean when she goes and visits canada her itinerary consisted of pictures <laughs> yeah well and i think that was also that was also the after the recovery of fred who um honestly i was uh, kind of upset he wasn't hurt worse in the bombing yeah um which uh, there was a little bit of the schadenfreude there with uh, that whole thing uh but i mean when she's convincing serena to to enact these laws to mm-hmm. uh, forge fred's signature over and over again to not just get rid of that overzealous commander but to try to make things a little bit better uh-huh and uh well obviously fred you know puts the bosh on that with that horrid scene that oh yeah well i think 
at the beginning, like, she was honestly doing some of the stuff that Fred wanted her to do. Yeah. Like, I think some of the things that she did, Fred would have been okay with. And so that's why, for a while, he, I don't, I think he might have known something was going on. Because there was some times where he was awake and he probably could have signed some stuff. Yeah. But, I don't know, she just went ahead and took care of it. Um, I think some of the things that she did kind of, you know, overstepping the boundaries is really what kind of, you know, drove him toward the pushing point. Like, I will let you break the laws up to a certain point. But once you do that, you know, I'm going to severely punish you for it, even though I was allowing you to break the laws. <laughs> well, it was preventing uh, it was preventing him from seeing her as something less than human. Yeah. Uh, he had to see her as a human being by her doing that. Which is so bizarre because we see in the flashbacks how they were more of a team. Yeah. You know, like, sure, they were definitely on the wrong team but they were they they were still a team together like he was building her up like no you go out there you be a leader like you show him you show the people you know what you believe and that's really what a partnership should be about Mm -hmm. and it's completely flipped like he couldn't give a heck about what happens to her i feel like he uh, maybe he does care a little bit but (laughs) it's not nearly like it used to be and i think she knows that no, he got he got his uh, sex toy, uh, mm-hmm. as it were. Um, you know, he got uh, you know his his way of being able to objectify and believe that his his feelings and his his desires were better than than any woman's desires because he's a man, well, and I, a white man. Well, and part of that um, had to do with Serena kind of helping push along those laws. Yeah. But anyway, I'm going to talk about that later. So. I don't know. We are kind of at... Should we continue on? Do we have another time? Some more time? Or should we split it up? Um, we should uh, split it up uh, into our two parts here. So um, we are going to wrap up in... Uh, this is the uh, first part of two-part episode here. Um, we talked about in this one, uh, the modern Gilead, about what's... Uh, the parallels of what's going on with the yeah. uh, crystal fascist movement now and uh, and how that is kind of the, the modern day Gilead. Uh, and we talked about the resistance and how that kind of looks in, uh, in Gilead as well as kind of uh, in the real world. As it were. So, um, yeah, uh, please join us for uh, our second part of this episode and uh, it'll be coming up right next.